Um, so hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Salvador Munoz, and I'm the associate. I'm the associate director of public programs and outreach at Poster House, uh, which is, of course, the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. Um, I am so excited to welcome you to this evening's program, uh, saying sorry three ways presented in conjunction with Poster House's fashionable exhibition, Air India's Maharaja, Advertising Gone Rogue, on view at Poster House through February 12th. Um, our guest tonight, fashion scholar Ardi Sandhu, will discuss the historic and contemporary resonance of the sari as both a garment and a symbol. Ardi is currently an associate professor in the fashion program in the School of Design at DAAP, the University of Cincinnati, uh, where her research is centered on contemporary Indian fashion and related design culture. Um, I see that you also have a long mouthful of a title. <laughs> um, so before we get started, I just wanted to share a few housekeeping notes on accessibility for this program. Um, so automated closed captioning is available for anyone who needs or prefers it. And you can turn that on or off by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and this program is being recorded and will be made available for all registered attendees after the event. Um, and then lastly, if you have any questions during the program, you can drop them in the chat or the Q&A box and I'll go ahead and vocalize them for you. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Artie. Thank you so much. That's awesome, thank you. Let me just share my screen and I need to make sure I remember to do it correctly. Uh, awesome. And I think you can see, yes, you can see something, a title slide. Yes, looks awesome. great. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, or if you're watching the recording, for taking the time to watch it later. I know this seems like a kind of a rather, depending on where you are, but um, Midwest, East Coast, I feel like the weather has just suddenly showed up and, and it's sort of a strange week. Um, but, and really thank you Poster House for inviting me to talk about my research. Um, I was really sort of excited uh, for many reasons. Um, you know, I have very fond memories, <laughs> complex memories of flying Air India. This is one of the first few airlines I ever flew with um, as a child from Delhi to Srinagar with a dog. So those are fun days. Um, and then also sort of just kind of <laughs> looking at the sort of um, kind of things around this exhibition. I, I particularly like one of these images that's in the exhibition that features the sari. Uh, I also have one of the little kind of Maharaja figurines from um, uh, Mumbai's Chor Bazaar. And then, <laughs> I don't know why I put this in here, but I seem to be channeling the Maharaja myself. So um, all these kind of signs were pointing to the uh, to in the right direction. But jokes apart, um, I do have to sort of admit at the start that I cannot profess to be an expert on the sari. Um, it's many ways of dyeing or the sort of variety of textiles. Um, that may come as some disappointment for some who are watching. Um, but the sari has been a, co a constant thread, uh, a companion through my research um, and sort of uh, on Indian fashion, but you know, fashion more broad as well. Uh, and through that, I've come to realize that it's the agency that uh, it, that the sari or fashion more broadly provides its creators and wearers to say something about themselves, whether it's individually or collectively, that interests me more. Uh, and so that's kind of what I hope you'll get through this talk. Um, and also, when I began my sort of research uh, on Indian fashion around sort of 2005, 2004, um, I have to say I was eager to avoid the sari, because at that time, I thought I was responding to uh, the fact that there was a lot that was written on the sari at that point. And I, and I really wanted to talk about in contemporary Indian fashion. Um, and at that point, I was also uh, very naively trying to look at this relationship between tradition and modernity, because at that point in my research, uh, I thought that these were two different things. Um, uh, and I thought that, you know, only through mixing these fashion could happen. Uh, but I realized later on that tradition and modernity are very, very connected and that traditions remain modern or have the potential to always be modern uh, as they were being reevaluated. 
uh, and and sort of based on what they brought to the contemporary moment. Um, so that's kind of my goal today, as I'm talking about the sari, to sort of examine it as a modern garment that evolves and shifts according to the time. Uh, and it's interesting, sort of, it kind of echoes a little bit about if you if you're familiar with the exhibition, sort of echoes some of how even the kind of the sort of impulse behind the the development of the Maharaja as a symbol. Um, so I, I'm interested in the sort of evolution of the sari as a modern garment um, uh, and then also sort of looking at it as a communication device for personal stories, uh, statements about national identity, design, cultural capital, uh, gender performance and of course political activism. So I'm going to present three three stories or three themes um, and these are themes, these are three different research projects. The first on the designer sari, uh, the second the sari as a medium for drag um, and then the third which is sort of my most recent uh, writing and research Research, uh, is the sari on social media. So really, you're going to get all my research in, hopefully, in a short frame of time. So I have to keep an eye on the time as well. And my purpose here is not only to show how it's a modern garment, but also the sort of superconductor for conversations around gender, clothing, cultural identity, and, and the sort of glue that can hold digital communities together. Uh, and then um, what I'm hoping is that after this talk, perhaps we can, if we have time to collectively reflect on why the sari is so conducive to this, or perhaps those are, those are some things that, that you can think about um, after this as well. Um, so before I jump into my three stories or subtopics, just some brief, some things that I want you to know about the sari, but I'm pretty sure that you already know these things, is that there are over a hundred ways of tying the sari. Um, and we know that it predates the introduction of stitched clothing in, uh, in South Asia, uh, it is not an, uh, a Hindu garment per se. Uh, it is seen more as a national garment, uh, one that sort of represents collective identity uh, and sort of beyond maybe even sort of the India as a nation, so South Asian garment. Um, but we also have to recognize that unstitched garments are, are part of Hindu traditions. Uh, we know that there are many, many regional forms of draping the sari. Uh, and interestingly, alongside those regional traditions are all also uh, sort of regional handloom styles or styles of weaving the sari that connect to these, these regional size, uh, these regional styles. Uh, and so really, it's important to know that it's never been a fixed garment. Uh, it's always been sort of uh, open to change and evolution, whether it's through how it's worn or how it's woven. Uh, but during the late colonial period uh, and during India's fight from independence, uh, certain styles of the sari take on a political kind of uh, symbol, uh, becomes a political garment. Uh, and it's from that period that the Nivi style that is most kind of now visually prominent uh, becomes a, sort of a popular style. So just to sort of give you a little bit of that background of the Nivi style. Uh, the Nivi style, which you see here, and you'll see in sort of the slides moving forward, is in itself a hybrid garment. Uh, it it's, uh, is broadly accredited to Janandani Nandani Devi, uh, who you see here, who was Rabindranath Tagore's sister-in-law. Uh, and she, being uh, sort of an educated middle-class modern woman who wanted to have a more public life um, was sort of faced with this dilemma of wearing a style of sari that was not necessarily uh, sort of uh, suitable for a public life uh, and so uh, hybridized the sari based on a style that was worn by the Parsi community uh, with a blouse um, and a petticoat and then also took the Gujarati style of the drape and, and sort of modified it to come up with, with this sort of style. Um, so it came to represent uh, a, 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 an educated middle, middle class modern woman during her time. Uh, but we also know that during the nationalist movement uh, with Gandhi, um, Mo, uh, his mobilization of hand spun, hand woven cloth as part of the nationalist movement. Uh, the handloom sari worn in the Nivi style that you see here took on a greater meaning, uh, especially as more and more women, women joined the nationalist movement. And you can see these sort of images on the right that show it as kind of the symbol of Bharat Mata or uh, Mother India. Um, so as, we, but aside from this popular image, if we look at photographs or images of the sun, 
Safari from the earlier 20th century, 20th century. and these are uh, some examples of my great grandmother. Um, we can see that the that even though women didn't take on European styles of clothing, their saris echoed uh, sort of global fashion trends at that time. So the sari was very much a garment that experienced fashion and was a fashionable garment. Um, so again, sort of moving through that, these are some images of my grandmother. So on the left is my grandmother in the 1940s. If you're familiar with 40s fashion, you will recognize the sort of puff sleeves um, and her style of hair. And then again, sort of this uh, image that we don't really know who it's of, but was uh, an image my grandfather took around the same time of a very fashionable couple. Um, moving forward, again, this is uh, Meher Castellino, India's first feminine Miss India in the 60s. You know, again, the sort of drape shifts to uh, sort of um, echo the ideal um, sort of silhouette of the time. And then into the 70s, we begin to see a real kind of uh, dynamism in the sort of design of sari prints, whether it was chiffon or synthetic materials, um, like you see on the left. Uh, an advertisement for Bombay dying. Um, but also we, we know that around this time, we begin to see other traditional styles of garments like the silvar kameez that become sort of more uh, seen as more modern or more fashionable. Um, and, and sort of women moving towards these and on the right is an image of my mother wearing one. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean, uh, so the sari sort of starts to become less quote unquote fashionable in some ways, but it doesn't mean that it didn't continue to undergo fashion change. So we need to be aware of that. Um, but we do see uh, more and more women, especially in sort of younger age groups and in urban spaces, uh, wearing either the silver kameez or moving towards Western clothing as we come towards sort of the end of this century. Um, and that sort of brings me to the first part of my research writing, which is more broadly on Indian fashion in the time period after economic liberalization. Um, which was uh, initiated in the 1990s. Uh, it was a time period that I'm very familiar with, you know, as a young uh, sort of school going child in India. Um, and these two um, cartoons by R.K. Lakshman capture the essence of what uh, sort of that moment was before liberalization. You see him in a sort of gingham shirt and dhoti and then in his sort of jeans and, and shirt uh, sort of moving into this new period. Um, and for those of you who don't know, these, this period uh, was uh, kind of witnessed a number of economic reforms that were meant to make India more competitive on a global platform. Uh, and as part of this, we saw a real influx of global brands. I mean, you see Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Um, but aside from that, sort of uh, global investments uh, and businesses coming in. And of course, that changed uh, the fashion retail landscape. So we see we, you know, we began to see fast uh, fashion brands like Zara opening up stores. Uh, but also high fashion, high luxury brands beginning to target the in Indian consumer. And, and this is uh, a line that Hermes um, brought out uh, to celebrate the opening of their store in Mumbai, I believe in 2011. Um, so it's sort of in 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 these uh, in the decades after the 1990s, uh, we also begin to see the Indian fashion industry realizing the potential of cultivating and catering to a local market. Uh, and it's interesting to see the shift because while I was in design school, um, we were very much learning design towards an export market. So this was sort of quite a different shift uh, to sort of think about the value of the Indian consumer. Um, and and sort of the emergence of brands uh, like uh, Ritu Kumar uh, that was sort of thinking about the needs and the tastes of this consumer. Um, and the many sort of factors that led to the emergence of a local Indian fashion identity at this time. Firstly, the sort of ongoing traditions of textile crafts and sort of dress practices, uh, but also the fact that traditional clothing was still the a preference amongst women in India. Uh, and then the last part being the ease and affordability of tailoring services and uh, textile crafts across India. Uh, so we began to see in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, the emergence of, of fashion designers who developed uh, a design language through reviving textile crafts and design practices. 
practices and uh, sorry, dress practices. And Ritu Kumar was, you know, really pivotal at this moment. And I don't mean to say that fashion or fashion design didn't exist in India prior to this moment. But as an industry, um, we sort of really see a lot of dynamism uh, kind of growing uh, at this point. Uh, so we we see sort of on one hand, hand this revivalist approach, uh, but also, uh, you know, a number of design uh, explorations that merge vernacular identity with a sort of a global, a new global outlook, uh, and, and sort of very vibrant explorations, uh, sort of uh, looking into uh, the history of cinema, like you see in the sort of Dawn Sari blouse uh, by Nida Mahmood, uh, and sort of a, a variety of explorations and, and what I would say uh, kind of hybridized design practices that were hinging on a fusion of uh, sort of Indian dress practices craft but also uh, global Western garments. Um, and so at this point we begin to hear the term global desi as the sort of ideal Indian con fashion consumer as well. Um, and we also see efforts by Indian designers to build a a point of distinction. Uh, and as I said already, textiles and traditional clothing were very much uh, a medium for this distinction. So some examples that I'm sure uh, um, attendees have heard of uh, were, uh, for example, Sabisachi Mukherjee, uh, who, uh, you know, famously sort of um, initiated what he called Save the Sari campaign as well as part of his couture collections. And saris featured in a variety of ways on his in his catwalk collection. So these are uh, sort of a few examples from 2012 uh, and then more recently uh, from one of his couture collections. Uh, that was shown solely of Instagram, where you can see him sort of branding the, the sort of his couture designs uh, and, and sort of naming certain saris um, uh, uh, as well. Uh, so we kind of see a number of varieties of, of outcomes here. We see some cases where the sari or the designer sari uh, in its wearing remains fairly intact, but it's the textiles uh, uh, that were being experimented with uh, um, uh, or the sort of craft of weaving was where the innovation was happening, but the sari was still uh, sort of intact and in how we are familiar with it. Or uh, in many cases, the entire sari, its structure, its material form was changed. Um, but but on the whole, you know, we, it was still a sari and how it felt and how it, how it was read. Um, so these are some examples. Uh, from a, of a colleague of mine who, of course, is now a very, very successful couture designer, Gaurav Gupta, who um, uh, is sort of credited for inventing uh, the Langa gown and the uh, sari gown. Uh, and then these uh, sort of also examples by Rimzim Dadu uh, and the sartorial sari or the stitch sari uh, by Rashmi Varma. And I apologize, it seems like my text fell off the slide a little bit. Um, and then along Inside this, we also see sort of initiatives like the Sari uh, series, the Sari anthology, about a sort of a series of films on how to drape the Sari. And I believe, I think, um, Border and Fall are doing a Sari draping workshop in New York, maybe over the next few days. I just saw that on their Instagram earlier today. Um, so one of the questions I think is sort of interesting to think about here, and you know, we see these examples of the sari being pitched as India's Birkin. Uh, and so, and, and I think sort of an interesting thing that I wanted to end this six segment on was that why is fashion so important? And why was this kind of branding of, of local identity so important? Um, and the reason is we know, and we know this through observing Western fashion capitals, that fashion is an important part part of cultural identity. And the recognition of being a fashion capital brings with it not only various sort of cultural benefits, but also economic benefits, not only for the designers who are selling these clothes, uh, but also ultimately you'd hope for the sort of framework and the sort of crafts people and the crafts and so on and so forth. Um, and this, this sense of being recognized as a fashion capital, we know also hinges on being able to create some sort of local, distinct local identity. Entity. Uh, and here is where the sari and other traditional garments and textile crafts were able to provide that kind of identity. So the sari became an important medium for the Ind Indian design industry to identify itself and, and distinguish itself from other fashion centers. Um, so again, <laughs> the trans 
partitions between my three stories are terrible. So I apologize already. Um, but that brings me to uh, to the the sort of theme of, of uh, drag, which is sort of looking uh, at sar the sari now as a medium for shaping South Asian or Indian drag culture. Uh, and through this, uh, a, a medium for a different kind of identity formation, for activism and creating awareness for LGBTQA issues. Um, and we have to remember this is happening alongside this kind of uh, the sari as a fashionable designer garment. Um, but before we kind of go into some of the research, it would be um, a real kind of, uh, it would be wrong of me not to show you a brief video clip by um, uh, Lahore, Rajasthan, performed by Professor Kareem Kupchandani, uh, who is a professor of theater, dance, uh, and performance studies at Tufts University. Um, they're the author of a style, Accenting Gay Indian Nightlife, um, uh, and then a Queer Nightlife, and then I believe is also working on a book on decolonizing drag, which I'm very excited uh, to sort of learn more about. Uh, so we're going to watch a short minute of this and then we will keep moving. Hopefully you can all see and hear. Yo, yo, we are live debuting Lahore, Rajasthan's first ever single. I don't want to look like all of the other drag queens. Leggings for days and dresses for miles and gowns for weeks. Chanel and Dior and Louis Vuitton Versace. Cause I look best when I'm dressed like an auntie Don't I look great in this sari? Cause I'm giving you this sexy body Too sexy, Don't I look great in this sari? I know right now I look so fly When I rock my desi style That is looking like a 100 rupee Sorry such a last season. Sorry. Learn to walk properly in that. Sorry. I know right now I look so fly when I rock my desi style. And I know just as you were getting into this, I'm going to pause it here, but I encourage you to seek out this video, play it on repeat, and then, of course, follow um, Kareem's work and writing because it's just fabulous. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, talking about um, dra uh, drag in India, um, uh, it was it was a few years after this this um, this video came out uh, in around 2017 while I was doing some uh, interviews around uh, social media use uh, that I met Alex Matthew. Um, who you see here uh, in their uh, drag um, uh, avatar as Maya, the drag queen. Uh, and I met Alex via social media. Uh, and at that time uh, in 2017, the drag community in India, so not the South Asian community outside of India, but within India comprised of a handful of artists who had only been performing at mostly underground queer parties or digital spaces. Uh, and Maya was one of them. Uh, and drag in India at that time was a complex space for two, two main reasons. Um, the first was the confusion, confusion with kinners or hijras, also referred to as Aravanis, who are eunuchs, uh, transgender people, part of a, a, a traditional community in India that dates back to ancient times. Um, they are considered part of India's third gender and are often traditionally seen wearing the sari. Um, so at the sort of initial point, there was for those um, uh, viewing or coming to drag shows, sort of a com confusion between the, these, the distinctions between these two groups. Uh, but more so, the sort of larger challenge was also that in this moment, uh, Section 377, uh, which was a British time era law established in, I believe, 18, in the 1860s, uh, a law that criminalized sexual intercourse between consent. consent consenting adults of the same gender was still in effect. Uh, and so any open reference to gay parties or events uh, came with the risk of being investigated by local police or prosecuted by law. 
And even though this law hadn't really been used or rarely been used and had even been suspended for a, a number of years, um, it was the sort of fear and insecurity within the LGBTQA community uh, who had already been victims you know, for, for, of police brutality and social discrimination. Uh, so it was at this moment the digital spaces were a safe site for self-expression uh, for emerging drag queens. And, and this is where I met uh, Maya. Um, but by sort of uh, late 2017, early 2018, and by 2018, the law uh, was struck down anyway, we begin to see more and more fe uh, events featuring Indian and Western drag queens at high profile clubs, such as Kitty Sue and Kitty Ko, um, uh, that was sort of five star hotels in India. And these uh, venues made drag more and more prominent and accessible to a wider audience. Um, my research focused primarily on uh, my conversation conversations uh, and sort of um, uh, with Alex and a few other drag queens at that time. Uh, and returning to Alex, um, who performed uh, as Maya, um, was at, at that moment one of the few publicly visible and openly gay uh, um, uh, female impersonators who was using the title of drag on social media networks. Um, and Alex sort of told me that uh, he had already, you know, in hindsight, toyed with drag when he was in 11th grade um, because he sort of remembers uh, how his mother helped him dress for uh, uh, sort of dress in the, sort of in a role inspired by one of his favorite uh, film um, uh, characters uh, and so he dressed in a dance costume that you see here uh, but years later he also became very disenchanted with the lack of opportunities in the local theater scene in Bangalore um, uh, and he was uh, inspired by watching clips and episodes of Dame Edna uh, and RuPaul's Drag Race and thought you know why not try experiment with drag uh, and turn many of his acting faults into strengths um, so for his initial drag performance as Mayama or which means the mother of illusion, uh, Alex once again turned to his mother for assistance. And this was sort of a turning point for him because he saw this as a continuation of his mother's legacy uh, and saw how uh, he could fashion Maya or Mayama uh, after his mother, but other familiar auntie figures in his life. Um, and so, uh, you know, he and and this was kind of helped by the styles of saris that he was wearing, uh, handloom saris draped in the Nivi style that you see here on the right. Um, so over time, Mayama transitioned to Maya, the drag queen, uh, which Alex said was a sort of a clearer title for people to understand. And Maya literally means illusion. Um, and the sari allowed him to sh uh, shift from being a stereotypical Malayali woman uh, to, uh, wearing a traditional sari uh, to a more progressive or uh, sensual woman wearing chiffon saris to becoming a Bollywood actress. Um, and uh, Alex's performances ranged from parodying familiar South, A South Indian auntieisms, uh, as you see here in this um, uh, YouTube series. Uh, where Maya drinks tea with guests and gives uh, feminist auntie advice to their viewers. Uh, um, uh, and so these kind of performances, uh, as well as singing to Bollywood classics and also Western gay pop anthems such as Bollywood single ladies. Uh, so in, in her performances, the sari heavily influenced Maya's posture and gestures. Uh, so we see gestures like wrapping the pallu, the flick of the sari, uh, the rhythmic walk to ensure the pleats don't fall apart, and the occasional flaunting uh, of the backless blouse. So overall, uh, the sari sort of added a, a, a sort of a lot to Maya's um, repertoire. Um, and the sari was not only easy to source, uh, but it, it was through changing its materiality also uh, allowed for a number of different styles of performances. Um, so stiffer saris allowed for a sort of a more kind of tasteful, imposing look uh, versus drapier chiffons that you see, see here allowed for uh, sort of performances that had more of a sexual uh, kind of implication. Uh, the latter of which was already a stereotype that had been made popular uh, in Indian films through a number of wet sari sequences, the most popular and iconic of which you see on this slide. 
Um, so the fashions worn by drag queens like Maya in this case, globally affirm the role that clothing can play in defining both acceptable behavior and deviance. Um, so in the case of Indian clothing, this is especially true if you think about sort of the long history of activism uh, and symbolism already that was vested in the sari. Um, so the mobilization of traditional dress by drag aunties then was a fitting extension of this lineage. Um, and But what's also interesting is that through parodying familiar, familial structures and stereotypes like the auntie, on one hand, you know, you can see um, that the drag queen is both challenging uh, and resisting uh, the sort of gendered and wider patriarchal frameworks, but at the same time also reinscribing these structures. Um, but we know through sort of everything we know about gender performance and drag that is through this parodying uh, of the sort of hollowness of patriarchal frameworks and gender performance. Um, the drag sort of, uh, you know, makes a kind of a statement about their hollowness. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to rush because I'm also <laughs> aware of the time. Um, but it brings me to the last part and, and the most recent part of my research, which was sort of happening around the same time uh, that I was uh, uh, that I met Alex via social me uh, media. And that was uh, a digital ethno of saris on social media uh, and the sari as a medium for forming digital communities. Now we all know you know that the internet has really sort of dramatically changed uh, fashion sort of expression uh, through being this accessible egalitarian platform uh, for fashion behavior, self-expression, sharing personal style. But for the most part we also, or at least in the beginning, tended to associate this style uh, of fashion influencers with younger communities and, and certain kinds of westernized fashion. Um, so this was where uh, in 2015, um, when two women in Bangalore, Anju Mugdul Kadam, who you see here, and Ali Matan, when they began what was called the 100 Sari Pact, they were able to challenge these stereotypes of around fashion on social media. Um, so for them, the 100 Sari Pact was a personal pact between themselves and their friends uh, to wear the Sari at least 100 times uh, in a year, uh, and then to sort of document that and record it uh, and sort of hold each other accountable uh, to wear the Sari um, as a way of respect, um, you know, uh, tradition, personal memory, so on and so forth. Um, but it was the, the sharing of this hashtag and the sharing of these images and the addictiveness of social media and platforms like Facebook uh, that made, and also sort of the design renaissance that the sari was going through in the fashion space, in the fashion industry, uh, that made this pact viral. Um, uh, and so while I wasn't aware of the pact being unfortunately still mostly a non-sari wearer, uh, I had begun to see um, this hashtag and, and the sort of the momentum building uh, in the sari pact, both on the sari pact web website that you see here, uh, but also on on uh, Facebook and, and other sort of forms of social media. Uh, and this is where I met, for example, Viji Venkatesh, who was at the time uh, one of the most sort of well-known Sari Pact uh, members uh, uh, at that time. Uh, and through speaking to Viji, um, I also then began to join a number of Facebook groups around Sari Pacts, one of them being Sari Speak, uh, which is a Facebook group run by uh, Vinnie Tunden uh, and currently has uh, about uh, sort of 160 followers, uh, 160,000 followers, uh, members that are spread uh, across the world, um, mostly in India, but of course, uh, uh, many sort of in uh, the UK and America and then other parts of the world as well. Um, and what's interesting about the membership uh, of these um, Sari Pacts or social media groups around the Sari is that most of the members who are active uh, appear to be women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, 50s, uh, um, 60s and onwards. So there's really not sort of one age group that you see only represented. It's, it's a wide mix. Uh, 
And the rules of these uh, social pacts are quite, uh, social media pacts are simple. Uh, members post fresh sari images uh, and then are required to say something about um, the sari that they're wearing. Uh, and a lot of this now sort of what began in these sari pacts now, of course, spills over into Instagram and sort of the kind of hashtags uh, like sari lover and sari pact and sari speak and so on and so forth. Um, so in these posts, of course, the first, first thing we notice is the saris, uh, the saris that are incredible, uh, some well-worn, some hand-loom, some brand new, some highly ornate. Uh, and then, of course, the sort of collections that women have of saris, how they stare at the store of them and so on and so forth. Uh, we also notice some members offering in-depth sari knowledge. Um, this is the late Chinna Dua, uh, who passed away uh, last year. Um, due to COVID complications, but was a very, very um, prolific sari wearer and, and sorry, sari packed uh, member. Uh, so we see sort of uh, a lot of information about the sari, but also members who innovate with the way of wearing and then in turn influence others with their styles of wearing. So we see we, Winnie Narayan here, who is uh, sort of uh, an incredible uh, sari influencer through her experimentation. Uh, but once you move past these images of the sari, you also begin to notice the individual stories. Uh, and when you take these stories collectively, uh, you begin to see how they capture many of the realities of contemporary womanhood within India and the South Asian dis diasporic community communities elsewhere. Uh, many of these stories are in keeping with broader expectations of morality, familial values, uh, and, uh, and a representation of transnational feminist ideal, uh, feminine ideals um, that are sort of uh, expressed on these global platforms. Um, but what's also interesting is it's through the sharing of these saris, uh, we begin to see a sense of mass intimacy, identification and subjectification. Uh, and when social media user, users make public aspects of their private lives, uh, we begin to see these sort of digital feminine intimate publics form. Um, and in the case of sari pacts and sari groups, uh, the act of sharing helps create a broader connection and a sense of intimacy through this sort of recognizable symbol, but also shared femininity. Uh, so in, in these groups, uh, the, the sari is the social group glue that sort of holds these relationships together. Uh, and, you know, we begin to see sort of a lot of the sari being a source of fun and camaraderie that transforms women in deep and meaningful ways. And we also see sort of these communities spill into not only digital, uh, out of digital spaces into real spaces like sari meets uh, that you see images here. So what is really sort of interesting to me in this moment in and in these uh, sort of examples of sari packs and the sari on, on the social media, is that we begin to see alternate models of fashion opinion leadership and style influencers emerge in ways that are uplifting and empowering for women who, for the most part, were underrepresented in print and popular fashion media. Uh, we also see in these sari pacts that women are far from being one homogenous group. Uh, so their sari stories reveal very layered identities, retired army officers who turn into school teachers, front like COVID-19 workers, but also handloom enthusiasts, uh, senior radiologists who are also craftivists. So a number of these sort of identities emerge um, that defy the stereotypes that we've come to kind of expect um, of, uh, of women wearing the saris. Uh, and so in these spaces, I argue that the sari acts as an agential garment uh, that inspires women to take control of their narratives uh, in ways that are also fun and pleasurable. Um, and sort of on this kind of this topic of fun and pleasure, um, the stories may not fall into uh, the category of hard edged political resistance, but but I would argue that they are still very important resources for feminist research, um, because it's these stories that push back against the victimhood narratives that often dominate writing about women from the global south. Uh, and instead, they, these stories highlight stories and images highlight how women's pursuit of fun and enjoyment can be an important way in which women push against and challenge patriarchal boundaries. 
So even though these platforms are, and we have to acknowledge, limited to elite and middle class, predominantly upper class, upper caste Hindu women, uh, these sari packs represent a new form of digital communities um, that are centered, of course, around the appreciation of traditional fashion, but also have the ability to alter our perception uh, of uh, traditional, the intersection of traditional fashion and feminism in the global south. Um, so um, again, hopefully you can see how the sari through all of these sort of different stories, but specifically through these last two ones is the social glue um, and the agential garment that can connect fashion to feminism, but also political activism. That's all I have. Uh, I hope you sort of enjoyed aspects of this. Uh, thank you so much again for listening and happy to take any questions or thoughts you may have. Artie, thank you so much. This was such a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me just stop, find my stop sharing thing. Awesome. <laughs> Beautiful to look at and so informative. Um, and if uh, you have any questions for Artie, now's the time to drop them in either the chat or the Q&A box and I'll go ahead and vocalize them for you. Um, and so this may have been like a portion of the presentation that I missed, but um, can you talk a little bit about like the the genesis or the need for like the Sari Pact? Well, I think, well, it, it was, for it, according to them, it was more of kind of a personal pact between two friends and sort of looking at uh, sort of the, uh, fashion influencers and fashion bloggers online, but not sort of seeing the sari in them. So when you kind of hear them both speak, uh, they are both very much sort of interested in uh, issues around um, uh, the, the sort of making of the sari or the preservation of craft. So they sort of saw themselves as by wearing the sari, not only were they preserving the sari, but also the craft of weaving. So it kind of started there uh, and then it just became viral um, and as you can see you know they're doing TEDx talks about it so it's sort of really incredible to see how it kind of moved up and then died away as well and now has all these other hashtags that sort of sprang from it. Very cool that's awesome. Uh, we have one question from the audience um, sorry about um, the blouse uh, portion of the sari. Um, so I've heard so many people say that blouses are what make saris what they are and can really elevate them. But the introduction of blou blouses into uh, our wardrobes has a violent colonial roots. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see that that's an interesting point. And, you know, I think that is a valid way of thinking about it, uh, where, you know, um, there is a kind of this imposition of um, colonial modesty that uh, perhaps uh, informed the choices that women made. Uh, but again, I mean, I, I also sort of think about uh, the sort of hybridization being kind of a natural outcome. So I, I, I see both sides of it. Um, and, you know, I, I do think the sort of blouse has become uh, sort of an interesting uh, part of the sari in itself. Um, I personally, for, and this is one of the reasons why I probably have not worn it enough, we sort of had this um, terrible image of the sari blouse in my mind that had to be kind of cut in a certain way, uh, but realize now that it can be anything or nothing. Uh, and sort of coming to that realization to me, really makes the sari sort of a very, very interesting garment. Um, but yes, the, the question is right in that there are sort of elements of, of colonial influence and, and sort of expectations of respectability baked into its early uh, wearing. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, you know, colonialism is global and inescapable. Um, that and I mean, I think it's interesting. I've been doing a lot of writing on decolonization. You know, it is sort of an interesting kind of concept that is now in all our spaces, but also sometimes gets bandied about as a solution to problems. Um, but the sort of this idea that it is also very hard to think of a pre-colonial space to return to. Um, and in pre-colonial spaces, there are also sort of uh, hierarchies and power dynamics that sort of mimic, uh, and even within sort of decolonization, there is the power dynamic that we tend to kind of replicate. So sort of navigating the imperfection of all of these things and sort of being fully aware of them that I feel is a good 
compromise. All right, thank you so much for saying that. I feel like often when we talk about like decolonial practices, it's very easy to sort of like flatten that narrative, um, but it is like truly complex and nuanced and like we can't move forward if we don't address those complexities. Yes, I agree. Uh, but it's like sustainability, it isn't a solution. Uh, it's sort of a threshold or sort of a door that opens the conversation to a set of other challenges as well. Yeah, yeah it's a practice, not like a, a solution. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Great. We have another question uh, that starts with just a thank you. And I have to like e echo these sentiments. Like you've been so generous with like sharing your scholarship and your research with us. So thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, they really loved all of the images that you shared. Um, and they were curious about how long you've been collecting these images for your presentation. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, and I should be more organized with them. Well, so, so, some of the, I mean, so I started some of this research around 2005 um, and, you know, it's, it's dates from that. I think sort of the digital images really kind of become more from the 2010s, but uh, some of that is from the book that I published uh, in 2015. And then of course, kind of all these different projects, but yes, it has been a number of years of just gathering and then also kind of realizing that our own uh, family collections have those sort of images in them as well. So, you know, learning to kind of look closer to home for evidence of fashion as well was really exciting for me. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you opened with like images from your personal, like familial collection, uh, especially loved the fashionable couple. <laughs> yes. Well, and I, I wish we had found that when my grandfather or my grandparents were alive, because we've all looked at that image and gone, like, who are they? Who could they be? I mean, we know that they're an army couple and probably sort of colleagues of my grandfather, but really don't know who they are. Yeah. Wonderful. And then my last question, and this may be sort of like more than we can unpack before we have to close out. So feel free to, to um, you know, nix it. Um, yeah. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, or just like briefly touch on like other um, traditional like Indian like garments. Like we, we spent a lot of time uh, focused um, on the sari, but there's also, we meant, we briefly touched on like lingas and stuff. So I'm just wondering if you could give like a brief sort of like over uh, view. Yeah, I mean, I think when you sort of, when you talk to um, uh, kind of people about traditional dress practices, the first thing most uh, kind of connoisseurs on Indian traditional dress practices will say that it's in our drapes. Um, so the it's not only the sari, but uh, the other draped garments, the men's draped garments, or also the garments that are worn uh, alongside like the, the, the butta or the, you know, the shawl or those kind of things. Um, but then of course there are stitched garments that come into that vocabulary as well. So the angraka and the anarkali. And, um, and I think it's interesting that all of those have become so much part of the Indian couture identity. Um, the sort of the cut of the, the stitched pajamas or the trousers uh, and the sort of um, kind of volume that they have. Uh, so it, it's it's all of them. And, and I think, you know, and they are sort of in conjunction with the embellishment of the textile techniques that go with them. I don't know if that, that kind of answered your question, but I think I think the sari stands out because it is perhaps the most, um, I, don't, I don't want to say recognizable, but it could just be also because of that symbol that it kind of symbolism that it takes on during the nationalist movement. And perhaps also because it represents, it you know could have uh, other sort of religious connotations that again, um, I know there was a New York Times article that spoke about the sari as a Hindu garment that was, you know, really, really kind of challenged uh, by sari wearers in India. But but there could be an element of that, that as well. This is why it is the sari um, that is that social glue. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, and yeah, then I'll pop my email in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then also, I know like a large portion of your um, presentation discuss like social media and social media ethnography. Uh, so where can people find your work? Uh, so if you email me, I can send you the most recent piece that I published, which was on um, uh, the social media, inf the Sari influencers and, and, and uh, feminism and, you know, what, whether it's, 
you know, how to kind of look at these from a feminist lens. I do, I have done some writing for um, The Voice of Fashion, which is uh, an Indian um, digital publication, which is sort of a more of an accessible space. Uh, but quite a lot of my current writing is sort of hidden away behind um, academic uh, what are those things? <laughs> Paywalls. Paywalls, but happy to share. Um, that's the, yeah, those are some of the things that I've been working on. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, Artie, thank you so much. This has been so fantastic. Awesome. I really did learn a lot and I appreciate your generosity and thought like in sharing this presentation. Um, and I, I just think that this is such like a great uh, compliment to our exhibition, which again is Air India's Maharaja, Advertising Gone Rogue, on view at Poster House through February 12th. Definitely come and check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and again, thank you so much. I had so much fun this evening. Awesome. Thank you so much. I look forward to coming and visiting you soon. Wonderful. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Take care.